before we get started, I just want to go over a couple of upcoming programs that we have. Um, so the exhibit that we're in right now is Outliers and Outlaws. The last day for this exhibit is on Sunday, February 18th. Um, and on that day, we'll have um, a celebration to kind of close out the exhibit. There will be some hands-on activities. We'll have some organizations here tabling. We'll be showing some clips of the documentary that they're making to go along with um, the Eugene Lesbian Oral History Project and as an outgrowth of this exhibit. So I encourage you to come to that. Um, and if you can't make it closing weekend, then um, you have a couple more weeks to get in and check out this exhibit if you haven't had a chance to do so already. And then this space will be closed for a couple of weeks. And on the weekend of March 9th, we will be opening a traveling exhibit from National Geographic called Wolves Photography by Ron Ronan Donovan. Um, and that will be up through about the end of May. So you'll have a few months to check that, but it is a little bit shorter than a lot of our exhibit runs. So don't wait too long to come see it. And on Friday, March 8th, museum members are invited to an opening reception of the Wolves exhibit. Is anyone here members? Look at that, quite the turnout tonight. If your hand didn't go up, now is the perfect time to become a member of the Museum of Natural and Cultural History. Uh, you can visit our website to learn more about member benefits, uh, or you can talk to the admissions staff on your way out and they're happy to tell you more about um, the benefits of becoming a member and can help you sign up if you're interested in doing so. With that, I'm excited to welcome our speaker for this evening, Dr. Sarah Graham. Joining me here on my right. Sarah is a marine ecologist from the Department of Integrated Biology at Oregon State University. Don't hold it against her. Go Beavs. <laughs> Go Beavs. Her research focuses on how species interactions and communities are affected by climate change, environmental variation, and marine diseases. She is currently studying the ecological consequences of sea star wasting disease for intertidal communities from Oregon to Central California. In collaboration with researchers from the University of Oregon, UC Santa Cruz, and the Oregon Kelp Alliance, Sarah is testing whether sunflower sea stars create a landscape of fear that could reduce grazing by urchins and help our kelp forests recover. Please join me in welcoming Sarah. All right, everyone can hear me. Okay, wonderful. Um, hello, my name is Sarah Gravem. I am I'm she, her pronouns, and I'm from OSU. Um, I've been in Oregon since 2015, I think. Um, so I'm, I think I'm an Oregonian now. Yeah. I'm a tra California transplant, sorry. Um, but I came here because uh, OSU has one of the best marine biology programs in the world. And um, the people that I work with are world renowned and awesome. And so that's why I'm here and that's why I'm staying. And uh, I like it a lot. Um, all right, so um, first off, I thought I'd start with the fun stuff. Um, so just like me and my kids in this picture, we're gonna do a little tide pooling together. Um, and the first thing is I want you guys to see if you can tell me what this species is. If we can make this whole puppy work. Yeah, it's weird because not even mine is working. Okay, I don't know. We'll find out. Okay, what is that? It's a cryptid. It's a hey, you cheated. <laughs> why? Why do you think it's called a cryptic help? Crap. Is anything weird about it right now? It's got a bunch of freaking algae stuff on its face. Um, yeah, they actually take and stick things to their faces, and that increases their camouflage. So they can like sit in the kelp and like they kind of hide and look like a less tasty treat for the passing otter or sea lion or what have you. Um, so they're really clever. They're very fabulous. Um, so we already knew that. Uh, does anyone know what this is? Yeah. 
Ooh, if you get species names, you get bonus points. <laughs> I don't even know the species names. Um, it's Tonicella something. Leaning on them, I think. Line chitin. So this is um, a, a gastropod, like a snail, only it's not a snail. It's its own thing. It's a chitin. They have eight plates on their back. And um, do you think this little puppy is um, fast or slow? Really, 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 really slow. Like you can't even see them moving unless you put it on time lapse. They're so slow. Um, and they just hang out in the bottom of tide pools, grazing very, very slowly along the bottom. So they eat algae and they are tough. If you've ever tried to pull off a chitin, it, it's not gonna happen. It's not gonna happen. You have to get at least a, a knife or something. Um, all right, anyone know what this is? What does it kind of look like? Centipede. centipede, scorpion. Think backyard a little bit more. Roly poly or pill bug? Yeah, this is actually in the same group as the roly polies, pill bugs that you see in your backyard. It's called an isopod. Um, the roly poly is one of the very few in this whole group. The, the group of roly polies is some of the very few that have made it on land. Most isopods actually live in the ocean. There's one in Antarctica that gets like this big. It's adorable and terrifying. Um, but what's um, what I like to, to point out on this guy is look how sharp its little feet are. That These ones live in, in tide pools and in, on kelp and they just cling onto the kelp for dear life when uh, like the waves come by or a fish comes by. And if you ever get one stuck on your finger, <laughs> it, it hurts. So um, don't do that. Um, and if you put them on your, accidentally get them on your jeans or something while you're out there, you'll find a crispy critter in your laundry later because they never like them. Um, <laughs> everyone knows what this is, right? I see it and them and them and them and them and them and me, right? So um, this is what Nemo, one of the types of species Nemo lives in, right? But this isn't obviously, this is an Oregonian one, not a not a Great Barrier Reef one, but they have the same idea. They have these sticky um, tentacles that come out and um, they defend themselves against attack and actually catch their prey with these sticky tentacles. And Nemo has slime all over him. That's why he has to brush his self on his anemone every morning because he has slime all over him to protect him. He doesn't get stuff. But if you stick your finger on this anemone, what does it feel like? Has anyone ever done that? Yeah. It's sticky. Why is it sticky? What? That's it's you that's why ultimately, but the reason it's sticking to you in the moment is there are millions of microscopic harpoons that it is firing into your skin <laughs> at that very moment. And they're poison tipped. So it's trying to eat you. <laughs> um, and that's why it feels sticky to us. Our skin's too thick. We don't feel the poison. We don't, we don't feel the ouch. But if you were a little isopod or a little tiny fish, you would be dead from neurotoxic poisoning in minutes. So <laughs> don't stick your tongue on one, okay? Yeah. Don't do it. Um, that's a red beaded sea anemone. It's one of the ones we have around here. It's a little more deeper than you usually see. Like you have to go on really low, good low tide to see one of those. All right, what about this one? Nudibranch. Naked gill. So nudibranch means naked gills. Um, there's a lot of um, things on Twitter and things where people send nudes meaning nudibranchs, which is fun. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> this is uh, a sea slug. So it's in the same group as, as regular land slugs. Um, and again, regular land slugs are a subgroup that made it onto land. Most sea slugs, most slugs are in the ocean. Um, and unlike our land slugs, it's got these frilly bits on its back and it actually eats things like sea anemones and hydroids and other stuff like that. And instead of getting harpooned in the mouth, they've evolved some crazy mechanism where they actually swallow the whole cell of the harpoon cell and don't let it go off. And they get it through their guts up to their backs and stick it in the backs of their backs. And then when a fish comes by and tries to eat it, that thing gets harpooned. Isn't it nuts? <laughs> 
it's the coolest thing. I want, I want the skills. I want the skills. <laughs> um, but these are called serrata. They are all over the backs of many, many nudibranchs, and it's usually either poisonous or filled with tiny harpoons that are gonna try and get you. Again, they can't hurt us. We're too big. But little other things, definitely. And this is a defense mechanism. This isn't like a, a predation mechanism. This is something to protect them because they don't got any shells, right? Mm -hmm. And they're very otherwise tasty. Mm -hmm. So that's an opalescent nudibranch. As you can see, we've got like thousands and thousands of nudibranch species on our coastline though. So they're like little, little jewels. Um, what's that? <laughs> Creepy thing. What does it look like? Spider. It looks like a spider. It is a spider. Oh. It's a sea spider. We didn't even, you didn't even know we had sea spiders. This is one of the ones we have on the Oregon coast. Um, and it, Surprisingly, its butt is that way and its head is that way. It looks like it should be the opposite, right? Based on what we normally see spiders as, but their abdomen's super tiny compared to their thorax, uh, their cephalothorax. And then you can see on the right, it's little tiny um, eyeballs, little tiny black spots. Those are its eyeballs. And it's got a giant proboscis, like a big tongue. And it actually eats anemones too. And so it doesn't eat the tops though, it eats the sides. So it goes up and like sucks on the sides of the anemones and eats them, which is crazy. So if you ever are looking in a bunch of anemones, start looking for one of these. They're only like the size of your finger now. Pretty little. Anyone know what that is? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Bonus point. <laughs> What's the common name? <laughs> Dead hand stinkers. Um, this is an algae we have on the Oregon coast. Um, it does it look delicious? It is pretty good. You can actually put them on burgers. You would think that we probably shouldn't have called it dead man's fingers if we wanted people to eat it. But, um, you know, it's, we don't actually want people to start eating them. They're not all that common, but you can go out there and take a little nibble if you want to. What is that? Has anyone seen that before? That's a really good guess, but it's not. <laughs> this is a rock surface. No? Is that's not an animal, right? It's it's something left behind by an animal. Any guesses on what animal that was? Turban snail. Turban snail. <laughs> Excellent. Turban snails. So turban snails are those little black snails you find all over the place when you go out tide pooling, right? They're they're like a dime a dozen. Um, but at low tide, they'll go through and they'll scrape the rocks and eat. And that's the tracks they make. They make these little cool zigzags. And what you can see is each line is um, the, the tongue scrape that it makes. So they have these like crazy tongues are called radula that have like thousands of tiny little teeth and they like lick the rock. <laughs> And then they'll, they'll like lick a strip and then they move a little and then they lick a strip and then they move a little and then they just like zigzag all day long. It's awesome. Um, all right, what's that? Urchin, right? And it's it's also a grazer, just like the snail, right? It's eating some, some algae in this picture. It's actually really, really eating that algae. It's really knotted down to a, a nub. That's bull kelp that it's on. You can see some bulk help in the background. This is a red urchin. These are the ones that we get uni from that you can eat in sushi restaurants. Um, the, that's sea urchin row, like sea urchin eggs. Um, and they have spines all over them, right? What are the spines for, do you think? Protection. Protection. Yeah. They're, they're also delicious. Um, other things like uni too are in the ocean. And they have this protective hard shell and these really, really pokey spines. And they actually have little tiny claws all over them if you really want to get into it. But those big, big spines are there to keep things like wolf eels and cabazon and fish from eating them. But there's one predator that kind of doesn't care about spines. Oh, sorry, red cedar gin. And it's this one. Does anyone know what that is? She knows. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she 
<laughs> this is Pycnopodia helianthoides. This is the sunflower sea star. This is what we're going to focus on today. But I wanted to just point out that, that these can eat those big spiky sea urchins because they're soft. They don't have to bite on it, right? They can like hold, hold it very gently and, and then they wait. <laughs> and they actually eat by, um, they'll swallow the whole thing, right? And put it in their belly and then they just digest it. And then they spit the empty test back out. You might've heard of also there's the, the, the ochre star, which is intertidal. And it um, is the one you'll find it if you go tide pooling, it's usually orange or purple. And they actually eat by barfing their own stomachs out <laughs> onto the rocks like this. And then they digest and then they suck it back in. But these ones actually are big enough to swallow and they'll swallow. So um, this is our, our predator of the day. It has um, up to like 24, 25 arms. Um, they can grow to a meter in diameter, which is like this. And they're one of the fastest um, sea stars in the world, one of the biggest sea stars in the world, and they're right off our coastline, or at least they used to be. And we're gonna get into all that in just a minute. Um, but before we go crazy on sunflower sea stars, uh, I wanna back up a little bit and just tell you about some of the work that my group, our ultimate goals and the people that I work with, and then we'll come back to this species in more detail in a few minutes, okay? Okay. So um, I'm a member of the Oregon Kelp Alliance. You can be too if you want. Um, the Oregon Kelp Alliance, it works for healthy kelp forests on, Oregon coast, on Oregon's coast. It's a big group of um, divers, scientists, tribal members, researchers, managers, conservationists, people from like ODFW and SGS, tour guides, sport divers, chefs, um, and other community members who generally are interested in having a healthy kelp forest ecosystem off our coastline. Um, we're actually having our science advisory team meeting next week. So these are some of the, the science advisory team right here. Um, and we come from different places. So Aaron Galloway is a professor here at UO. He's actually out at OIMB um, in Charleston at their marine lab. And then Sarah Hamilton um, was a graduate student in my lab and now she's the, the science lead of ORCA. And then uh, me, and Dan Abbott, who is the head of Oregon uh, Reef Check, actually California Reef Check too, but um, he's actually at Truckee of all the places. But uh, <laughs> but he's a really, really well uh, versed diver and he runs the volunteer diving program. And then Tom Calvinese, who's also at Oregon State and um, is the like founder and I don't know, head honcho of, of Orca. <laughs> Um, and we also have a lot of other people. So it's not just scientists, and that's the point, right? It's it's an alliance. There's all these people in our on our community that want to help help the kelp. And so we have people from uh, algae uh, ranches that are out in Bandon that are working on um, urchin ranching and algal growing. And so they'll be like supplying restaurants and stuff like that. And then we have people like uh, chefs from Redfish, which is a real fancy restaurant in Port Orford. And the Nest, which is a not so fancy restaurant in Lang Langloy, <laughs> um, that are working on getting people to eat uni so that we all like it better and we make it part of our diet. Um, and people like Dave Lacey from South Coast Tours, who does whale watching and also helps us get out of our sites um, and outfit our, our divers. So um, the reason we all are in Orca is because kelp forests benefit not just the forest itself, but benefit us um, in many, many ways. So the first thing is kelp remove carbon pollution um, from the atmosphere, they, they sequester it, and they protect our coastal environments from wave um, exposure, like they'll deaden waves as waves come in and keep um, erosion down. They also serve as habitat for all sorts of animals. There's like some quote by some famous scientists, like if you're in the ocean, if you're an animal in the ocean on our coastline, you're benefiting from kelp in some way. You're connected some way to kelp. Um, they are making the habitat structure. They are the trees of the, of the ocean. Uh, imagine if we had no trees left in Oregon, it would be a big difference, right? So the kelp are the trees of our kelp forests. Um, they're also better than trees. <laughs> 
because lots of things eat them. You don't really see things like walking around snacking on trees, right? <laughs> Maybe some bugs and stuff, but that's about it. Um, but everything eats kelp, at least all the grazers do. And they just munch on it. It's not like they have to only eat the new shoots or something. They they can, you can just eat kelp. You can eat kelp. I've eaten kelp. You can take a bite out of it. It's e easy. Um, and it also um, creates all sorts of three-dimensional habitat and structure for things like sea lions and otters and things like this to live in. And whales, actually, whales really like kelp forests. These are the types of kelp we have on our coastline. The main one that you'll see making forests, at least, is bull kelp. It's called Muriocystis lutkiana. It is a long, long, skinny, skinny stipe with a bubble in top. It's filled with carbon monoxide, go figure. And it has um, really, really big blades on the top that that's what things are eating for the most part. And then we have some other shorter kelps, like ribbed kelp, woody kelp, and torn kelp. And those are the types of things you might see if you go out at low tide swashing around in the waves. Or if you go on water, that's when you really see them. And this is what the kelp forests in Oregon look like. They are not the cathedral, beautiful, National Geographic shots like you see from Southern California. They are dark and they are full of stuff, right? So we've got things floating around stuck to the bottom, swishing around. You might see a sea star or two. You might see clams, mussels, urchins. Um, it's really green, right? This is really productive. All that green is, is phytoplankton in the water. It's full of nutrients. And then if you look, uh, if you notice, you're actually seeing all those little specks in the water, right? Does anyone see what that, have a guess what that is? Krill. Yeah, that's krill. And so the krill, especially in Oregon, really love the kelp forests. And that's why the whales like the kelp forests. They come into the kelp forest to hunt the krill. All right, so that's what our Oreg a healthy Oregon kelp forest looks like. This was taken, um, I think, off of Cape Ergo. And this is what um, an unhealthy kelp forest looks like. And we call this an urchin barren. This is down in Fort Orford, taken just a little, I think, this summer. And I want you to notice the differences, right? So first of all, I'm not seeing any swish in algae. I'm seeing a lot of rock, right? You can actually see the bottom in that last one. You couldn't see a rock because everything's covered in stuff. But what you can see is these purple sea urchins, which are hungry little buggers, and they're eating all the algae. And they're leaving behind just this film of like pink, crusty, algae behind, which is that like pink color on the rocks. And it's not very edible. It's full of calcium carbonate. It's very crunchy and things don't really like to eat it. Um, it's kind of the last algae standing. <clears throat> so this is a big difference, right? And this is a concern of ours. So um, the reason orca exists is because people, divers, urchin hunters, things like that came to us and were like, holy crap, it looks absolutely different under there than it used to look last year or the year before. And all of a sudden, all the uni is terrible. I can't sell it. And the rockfish fishing has gone down and the spear fishing has gone down. And we have a problem because I can't enjoy my ecosystem like I used to. Um, so the or Oregon Kelp Alliance really came not from the science scientists. It came from the community coming to the scientists being like, this is different, this is bad, we have a problem. Um, because a lot more places look like that urchin barren right now than that kelp forest right now. There's only a couple little patches of kelp forests left on our, on our coastline and they used to be all over the place. And so we were trying to figure it out, right? There's a couple different reasons this could be. It could be climate change, it probably is climate change at least to some extent, but one big thing, um, and also there's an overabundance of urchins that might be part of it, but we don't know what's driving their dynamics. So there's a lot of competing hypotheses right now, but I wanna talk about today about one hypothesis that I think is really, really going on. And it lines up almost perfectly with all of this, the devastation that we've seen. So that's the sea star wasting disease outbreak. So this outbreak started in California and Washington in 2013 and it spread to Oregon by 2014. Um, it has now gone all the way from Baja, California to the Aleutians. 
and it has affected over 20 species. It's the largest marine epidemic ever. Um, it's bigger than, than anything we've ever seen. And the, the symptoms of it are things like arm loss and twisting and, and essentially melting uh, right in front of your eyes. So, and it happens really fast. Like it's like within days that sea star can go from totally healthy looking to like a pile of goo. Um, and once they start having those symptoms, they don't usually get get better. They they're toast. Um, did anyone see this when they when this happened? It was revolting, wasn't it? Um, I mean, it was like the whole coastline was covered in carcasses. It was really sad. Um, and we think it's caused by a virus, um, and it's still happening. It's it's still happening at low levels anyway. It's not gone, but it isn't in like outbreak anymore. So but what we're talking about today is this sunflower sea star, and it was hit really, really hard. A lot of sea stars were hit, but that one, the sunflower sea star was hit the hardest. And I think I'm actually going to skip this because we're getting, I'm going too slow. Um, all right. So ultimately, um, there was a, an outcry in the science community and, and the general public saying like, holy, this, this species went down. And a couple of years later, we kept hoping it would come back and come back and come back. And it really didn't. And so it was like, oh, this is a problem. This is something that's not going to right itself. And so me and Sarah Hamilton and a couple other people um, ended up doing a global synthesis of, of the sea stars population and got all the data we could find and figured out that there were um, the average decline globally was over 90%. For this sea star, can you imagine if like 90% of, I don't know, the crabs were gone in like a couple months? <laughs> Not cool, right? And um, the range contraction went, they like used to go down to Baja, like at that tip. And the lowest, um, the lowest, uh, the south, most south you could find them a couple years ago was like the bottom of Vancouver Island. So it's like a third of their range gone. And then um, we calculated that over 5.75 billion animals died with the B, um, and just for this species. And this was only one of 20, and we didn't even try for the other ones. Um, it ended up being that it qualified as critically endangered for the IUCN Red List, which is a, um, a UN body that ranks species health. And then in March, it's probably gonna get listed under the Endangered Species Act. So it's gonna be only like the second or third uh, marine invertebrate to be on the endangered species list. It's probably gonna end up as threatened, not endangered, which is kind of good because that means there's no legal ramifications if you like accidentally pick one up. <laughs> Do you have a question? Yeah, oh, lots of math. Um, but <laughs> so ultimately we found, so every one of those dots on here, is a survey that we put into our study. And so we took all the surveys that had been done beforehand and all the surveys that had been done afterward and looked at the intensity of the density drops um, before and after the disease. And we separated it by region and the region separations are on the colors. So what you can see is like, the reason we did, reason we did it by region is because it was clearly different by region, right? So the, the percent mortality down in California was above 97% all the way through. And actually, I think it's actually higher. This is kind of a conservative estimate. And then up in the coastal Canada and Southern Alaska, it's like up in the 92, 95-ish. And then as you get out into the Aleutians, it seemed to drop off. But there's actually not that many sea stars out there anyway. So um, they didn't get hit as hard, but they're also not like super abundant out there. Um, so the ultimate answer is, anyway, there was a lot of math and we have a whole paper about it if you want to read it, but I won't get too into it here. <clears throat> so everyone always asks what this has to do with climate change. I actually don't think it has a super duper tight relationship. Um, the trigger for the disease does not clearly line up with warmer temperatures. Um, like the initial outbreak timing doesn't really warm up. There's been some evidence for, some evidence against. But what is clear is that warmer water increases the severity. The disease spreads faster, more animals die, and that has resulted in this northward range shift. So it's not climate change, but temperature is certainly involved. 
right? And so if temperatures get warmer, that makes it worse. All right, so that means recovery might be harder now than it would have otherwise been. Um, a bunch of folks got together and have created this roadmap to recovery for the sunflower sea star. We're using this as our new guideline for how we're going to plan the next you know, several years of recovery actions. Um, one of the pieces is this poster that I made. <laughs> so if you've seen one in Oregon, I want to know because they're not that common. And um, even just seeing one is a big freaking deal. Like I haven't seen one in Oregon yet. So, and I've been looking. So um, if you scan this thing, I'll show it again later. If you scan that thing, you would be able to just go to our website and report it. Um, we want a photo, we want a location, we want a date. Um, and the, the website, if you want to just remember, it's cstarwasting.org. If you search Star Wasting, it's the first thing that pops up. One, one question. Yeah. Yes. That, Same thing. Yeah. The Star org site is run by Santa Cruz. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for doing that. We're actually going to use your data this week in our staff meeting as a like synthesis. So if you, Thank you're you probably know. in there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> first mature organ, some folks. What's your name? Oh, I've seen your name. <laughs> yeah, you can see them intertidally at a really low, low good tide. Apparently, there's a bunch of them underneath the Newport Bridge in the Eelgrass Bits mm -hmm. and in Coos Bay. But um, I would think you'd need to be at least at going on a really, really good tide or snorkeling or diving. They used to be intertidal. You used to be able to find them, but I think they don't really like being in the intertidal. Oh, Fritz, we've dove together before. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Yeah. 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 You're Doug's dad. <laughs> okay. All right. So um, there have been a couple. Uh, back in 2021, Dr. Galloway found a few in Coos Bay and Port Orford. Those were the only ones we knew about for a while there. Um, but only this year have we started actually seeing, them, or last year, I suppose, um, them in like honest numbers. And so in spring, there was one in Port Orford and we like lost our minds. And then um, in August, the Newport Aquarium found about 50 under the bridge near the aquarium. And then the, the OSU students, or the UO students actually found a bunch on one of their marine biology field trips um, in Coos Bay, which is really cool. So there's probably more, I'm sure Fritz can tell you. Um, but uh, these are some of the main ones that we're, we're getting really excited about. So they're around, they're making it. That's really great. Hopefully they stick. <laughs> yeah. It is look like they're very small, so apparently young. Mm -hmm. How long would it take one to grow to one meter? That's, oh, the one meter ones I think are like decades old, mm -hmm. but um, I, they get to about the size of your hand in four years. So they're not, you know, the one in this guy's hand is probably three or four years old, I think. Um, but these little ones are, are, are warp one this year, probably, or last year. All right, so the reason we care is because Sunflowers not only are cute, but um, they also eat sea urchins. So this is a shot of a sunflower sea star eating a green sea urchin actually up in Alaska. And if I told you that sea urchins have claws on their backs, see those little black marks? That's the, the claws that the sea urchin has tried to defend itself with, but, um, and pinched, pinched the, the sea star, but uh, not so much. Um, all right, so we care because of trophic cascades. Trophic cascades are a scientific concept of why which top predators affect grazers or herbivores, and that has effects on the plants, right? So if you lose your top predators, like we've lost now otters 100 years ago and now sea stars, our sea urchins are going bananas and our kelp is suffering, right? So if we were, oh, there it goes. There, the sea urchins are going crazy and the kelp is suffering. Um, so, <laughs> A lot of people have been advocating for bringing otters back. I'm all for that. Um, I'm in, sounds great. Um, it's it's gonna be a lift, right? 
Otters are mammals. There's a lot of rules. Um, and even if you were to get some otters back, you know, we're talking about let's take 10 of them. Let's take 30 of them. That's not going to have a huge impact on the ecosystem quite yet. But sea stars, on the other hand, make a million babies a year. And so if we can just get some of those going, they will do the job for us. Um, otters make one baby a year, if we're lucky. So my uh, soapbox is that these would be a lot easier to get back and a lot uh, more, it would be a lot quicker. And the reason that I also care is because not only do they eat lots of urchins, which could benefit kelp, they scare the living crap out of them. Um, unlike otters who come from above and, you know, um, pick one up and then everyone's like, oh, where did he go? Um, and they're none the wiser. Sea stars are slimy, they're slow and they stink and they, live down with the otter, uh, urchins. And so I want you to show me where the very first Pycnopodia uh, in California we have found in the last five years lives. Where could it be? It's right there. So what I want you to notice is A, first it has like three big lumps in its belly. It's trying for more. And the rest of the urchins are sitting on the ledge going like, <laughs> and, and they're freaking out. And what we're gonna do now is back this video up. And I want you to tell me where that sea star has been in the last couple hours or day as we zoom back out. Because what you can see is this footprint of where that one animal has scared the living bejesus out of everybody. And, and we can see that it has this landscape of fear effect on the ecosystem. And imagine if we had, you know, 70 million of those in Oregon, which we used to. All right, so unfortunately, it's really hard to study sea stars in Oregon because there aren't that many of them. There's like eight. Um, so I had to go all the way to Alaska to um, do this research. And I'm not gonna go too, too crazy on graphs and stuff, but know that um, we are working on this kelp forest urchin pycno relationship all the way up there because it's where we can actually do the research to inform what's going on down here. Um, we have a really great PI team. This is Christy Croker from Santa Cruz, Aaron Galloway from UL, and me. And then um, a lot of graduate students and a lot of undergrads and a lot of volunteers. Um, and we're all working on different pieces of the project. Um, they all interlock to understand how sea stars affect kelp forests. I'm gonna talk about just a couple of them. Um, and there are more, but First up, I wanna talk about the Pycno Klein experiment. So we're interested in how far away from a given sea star the sea urchins change their behavior and stop eating or flee or do their things. So she's doing this really long skinny experiment with flow going one direction. So that we have upstream and downstream effects of a Pycno that's at least in this one stuck in a cage. And what she's finding is that um, actually being a caged stationary sea star doesn't really scare them all that much. But when you let that out of the cage, they freak out. And um, they overall reduce their grazing rates on the kelp. So it has not only to do with the smell, but to do with like that interaction that they're doing with the, with the urchins. Mm -hmm. And then we have an undergraduate group who went up to Sitka during winter break gnarly, um, and did this really cool experiment where they stuck the sea stars in the cages, because in at least in Nikki's experiment, you could imagine like if, if there was a smell in this room, you might be notice it at first, but they would, it would, you know, you wouldn't notice it after a while. So we're kind of trying to say, okay, smell doesn't matter in this like tank, but doesn't matter in the field. And so we took and put these sea stars in these cages inside of a barren, and then we ran kelp lines out from the sides and there's a bunch of urchins all over the place. And so we left that out for the day and then went back the next day to count how far away were the kelp or, or the urchins and how did the kelp uh, fare. And um, it showed that sea star smell only scared the red urchins at least and not the green urchins for some reason. And it ended up benefiting the kelp up to about two meters away. So this is distance from cage here. This is the sea star effect. So they're having a negative effect on sea urchins close um, and the sea urchins are moving away. And then they're having a positive effect on kelp and yellow here. And then a negative effect far away where the sea urchins ex 
escape to. And where that like effect disappears is about two meters away. So that's their stinky footprint. Think about the stinky footprint. Okay, so now does that translate into real life? So this is my student, Miles. He's an undergraduate at OSU. And he did the burst experiment where he went out and found one and surveyed all around it and checked how far away everything was. And so this is the distance from the cage or from the sea star here. And this is the density of the different prey. And so abalone and green urchins have a slope, right? So there's fewer of them close to the sea star, more of them farther away from the sea star. And at first we were like, red urchins don't care. They're not doing anything. And then we're like, but what is the background density of red urchins at this site? And we mapped uh, the green urchin density in the background and the red urchin density in the background. And we found that for greens, they kind of reach the background density at like four meters away. So that's kind of like where the sea star effect disappears. But red urchins never reach it, which means so like this line and this line don't even cross, right? So that means they're actually probably going farther away than four meters, which is pretty cool. There's some evidence that active sea stars are more scary than inactive sea stars, which is not surprising. Uh, I'm not gonna show you that data because it's a little complicated, but um, that kind of agrees with our lab experiment, right? Okay, so now we wanna know what happens when we just stick one of these buggers in a urchin barrel and watch it go crazy. <laughs> so this is a video uh, on time-lapse of a 20 minute hunt by a sea star. And what you can see is every single one of those little blobs is an urchin running for its life. And <laughs> the sea star is like, gimme, 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 gimme. So um, this is just a 20 minute foray, usually like a meter or two. And what we did was um, go down and survey the track um, before. So we got the, the starting density and then after, and we did it all the way out four meters away from the track after the first hour. And then we actually went out and did it the next day and the next day and the next day to see if those urchins that fled would come back and be like, it's gone, you know? Um, and what we we found was, first of all, that uh, if this line sloped, that means people, things took a hike, right? So. There, there are fewer of them close to the, the track and more of them farther away. So abalone are scared, greens are scared, reds are scared, which is what we didn't see in the last one, so that's good. And tegula run around like uh, like in circles. They're, they're not very, they're not very good at running away. <laughs> they're very small. Um, they're only like this big. All right, so what we can do then is <clears throat> map how that changed relative to the, the starting densities in the, in the beginning of the experiment and look at and like map this zero line as kind of like the background level before we began of their density and look at where this line intersects with this dashed line. Don't get too complicated or don't think about it too hard. But essentially, we can then drop that line down and say, OK, how far away are they running on average? And for abalone, it looks like they're running about three meters away. And for greens, they're running about four meters away. And for reds, they're running about four meters away within an hour, right? So this is just the first hour. Okay, so I want you to raise your hand. I'm gonna raise my hand. You raise your hand. And you in the yellow, raise your hand. That's about four meters. So just one 20 minute hunt, four meters radius. That's tw uh, 50 meters squared footprint. And that's just from one little hunt for 20 minutes, right? And not only did that 20 minute hunt cause this stampede, is what we're calling it, um, it, it lasted for three days for um, urchins, at least. It lasted for a day for Avalon. So they were, they didn't come back. They stayed away after that three day hunt. So they're like scared. All right, so ultimately we want to know not only does this happen on a short day, couple day long thing, we want to know how it, whether it lasts and whether it has potential to benefit kelp growth. So the next big experiment we're doing is called the pick pen experiment. <laughs> and this is a five by five meter pen that we put out in the bottom and stuck the pick nose in it and the urchins in it and watch them freak out. 
for a few days. And the biggest challenge, honestly, that we've been having is that the Picnopodia escape. Oh. They are so good at climbing. And we were like, oh no, our whole thing is ruined. So we ended up putting pigeon spikes all over the tops of the cages and they got their little, they got their little arms stuck in there and then they got stuck and they didn't know how to get out and they stayed in the cages. So we're really proud of ourselves. <laughs> And um, this is our next big thing. So we're working on funding right now. We think TNC is going to bite um, to fund us to do this and put like eight or 12 or 16 of these out underwater for a year in Alaska to try and get uh, kelp to actually grow inside the cages with the pycnos. We think that's going to happen. We're not sure. And maybe it won't, but at least we'll know. And that's going to really be crucial because if we don't have that like long-term benefit on kelp picture, no one's going to spend the multi-millions of dollars it's going to take to repopulate these animals, especially in California where there are zero of them, right? And we're not going to be able to convince ODFW and CDFW to give us the permits to actually do it because it's challenging, risky, we're moving things around that are potentially diseased and scary for them. They're like, oh, um, but if we can prove the upside, right, or at least show the upside, that would outweigh, hopefully, the risks, if we can actually uncover the relationship. And it may not happen. That's what science is all about. But um, this is the only way we're going to figure it out without, short of, like, putting thousands of them into a reef, which I will do if you'll get you know, but no, they won't let me do that yet. <laughs> All right. Um, this is just to say this is this is no small task. This is me pulling up like hundreds and hundreds of pounds of hardware out from the bottom of the ocean mm -hmm. with um, airbags. So it takes a lot of work to put these types of things in the water. It's um, but it's a lot of fun. Um, ultimately, we want to do some of the stuff in Oregon. Now that we have Picnos, we could actually get it done. Like say, repeat this Star Trek experiment with purples here. Repeat um, that Pycno Klein experiment down here with purples. And I didn't even say this, but in Alaska, we only have reds and greens, red, red and green urchins. We don't have purples. And so they, they might act a little differently. We think they're gonna act kind of the same, but a big question remains of like, are the purples just as scared as the reds and the greens? And we think they are based on that one video I showed you of the one in California, right? Um, okay. We're hoping for reintroductions, maybe 2025. I don't know. And um, if you want to get connected, you can follow our Oregon Kelp Alliance Instagram and Twitter. Um, you can also follow Pisco Science, which is a broader, broader research consortium that I'm part of. Um, you can report your sunflower sea star sightings to seastarwasting.org, please. Um, if you're a diver, start diving with Reef Check, like Fritz. He can tell you all about it. Um, our, our reef check uh, leads are actually the owners of the Eugene Skin Divers shop right here. So you can go in there too, they'll help you. And then um, go to a bio blitz, the Oregon Coastal Crane puts those on, eat some uni, try it out, and go fishing or tide pool. That's how you can get them all. Um, and I am, my email's here, and I wanted, oh, maybe I didn't put it. I'll, I'll put that uh, QR code back up so you can go to the website if you want to. Okay. I think I went a little all on, sorry. <laughs> Two minutes for questions. Yeah. Back. How readily can you grow Pycnopodia in the lab? Oh, not readily, unfortunately. I, you can do it. Um, so it had never been done before wasting. Like no one had ever done it. One person at UO had done it like up to like five days past um, settlement. So the, the challenge, right, is that they make a million eggs, eggs get fertilized in the open water, and the, and the larvae float around for two freaking months before they settle. And they look absolutely different. They look like aliens. And then they, they settle down into the, the rocky shore and more metamorphose, kind of like a butterfly into a teeny tiny, tiny speck of a sea star. And then that tiny speck takes, you know, eight months to get this big. And so the infrastructure that you need to make that is not small. 
Um, you need really clean, healthy seawater with no bacteria and no paramecia and nothing in it. And then um, to grow them up further than that, like the, the mortality rate's like 99%. So it's challenging, but UW has done it. So um, there's a group up at Friday Harbor Labs and they've got four-year-olds now and they're like this big. Yeah. So they've got 12 of them. <laughs> and then uh, and then the, they have a bunch of, they have like 123 year olds and 501 year olds and and they're making, they're figuring it out. They're really starting to get the, the, the protocol down. Mm -hmm. um, but that means, so, so there's actually a thing called a SAFE. It's a um, zoo and aquarium prerogative. It's kind of like the same thing they would use to make a condor program or make a coral program or a clownfish program. They, they're making one now for Pycnopodia. And so we've got like eight or nine aquariums that are interested in trying to grow them, including the one in Newport. So we're hoping that the aquarists will bite and get that scaled up for us because we can't do it. We don't have the staff and the, the seawater systems. Yeah. Yeah. So is Pycnopodia considered a, a keystone species in that sense? It's a good question. Um, I wouldn't go that far yet, but when we get that pick pen experiment finished, I'll let you know. Um, so right now, keystone species means that it has an outsized effect on its ecosystems, biodiversity, based on its biomass. So like one otter can have a really big effect on the biodiversity of its reef, even though it's just one otter, right? And so the idea is it might be, um, but we don't really know like how many you need to elicit an effect. We don't know how big of an effect one has versus a hundred and, and, and things like that. So we think it has a big effect. I mean, the timing of everything, of the, the, the picno going down, the urchins going up and the kelp going down is uncanny. And the spatial footprint of all those things lining up is also uncanny. So it's not out of the question that they're keystone species, but um, I'll get yelled at if I say that they are. <laughs> <laughs> Without the experiments to show. Yeah. Yeah. Is there any uh, historical evidence or Bible stories that this has happened before? Oh, good question. I don't know. There are other, there's evidence in the scientific literature of of wasting events for sea stars happening in like the 80s on Channel Islands, but we don't know if it was the same thing. It was really local. Um, I don't know if anyone knows or knows who to ask. I'd love to to pick that, pull that thread. Yeah, yeah. So, has there been any determination about what? Virus. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that the virus was the first the first suspect, and then it got really muddy, and there were some subsequent experiments that kind of pointed away from virus, and people were like very confused for a little while. I wasn't a big fan of those experiments. Don't tell them. <laughs> um, but uh, there's been some people from um, Hakai, which is the UBC group and um, Point Defiance up in near Seattle that have done some experiments this past summer and the one before, and they're narrowing it down. And they're almost certain it's a pathogen, but they're not certain it's a virus anymore. They think it might be something bigger. And so this is like something someone told me last week. So um, anyway, whatever it is, it's, it's a pathogen that's being passed through seawater and it's contagious. So, but we don't have, we don't have a test for it, we don't know what it is. And imagine like trying to fight COVID without a rapid test, right? Like you can't do it. Like you don't know who's sick. Um, and so we, we don't know who's sick. And that's one of the biggest reasons we aren't yet to the point where we can actually start moving them around is because we can't guarantee that this one's healthy, that we're gonna move from that reef to that reef or that state to that state, right? Mm -hmm. And ODFW will not let us do that until we know that that one's healthy. So we might be doing like quarantine periods and tests and stuff that aren't diagnostic, but like challenges and anyway, lots of tech, red tape. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, for good reason. Is there any uh, predators out there that are being harvested, commercial harvest, uh, like octopus or crabs that uh, the completion of those communities are affected? 
Yeah, I mean, lots of the predators are are harvested crabs, octopus, fish, but most of the, them aren't urchin predators. Urchins are really well defended, and wolf eels will eat them. Sheephead will eat them. We don't have those. I don't know that octopus eat them, but so I don't think it's another predator. I think it's and 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 those types of fishing predator pressures have been there. For decades, right? We've always we've had a crab fishery for decades, and the urchins weren't affected. And so, I think that this the alignment in time is really what what convinces me that it's the sea stars, not something else. Yeah, and we haven't had otters for a hundred years, so and it was okay. I mean, not great for the otter, but for the ecosystem was okay. But now it's not so okay. Yeah. You've heard of otters. Yes. Everyone loves otters. I know the word. So, given that you're working up in Alaska as well, where there are at least some otters, yeah. um, do you see any kind of interactions between like sea stars and otters in the way that they like, affect the, the ecosystem? You're telling me the hypothesis of my whole next NSF group. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, we're trying to figure oh, out okay. now. <laughs> Like what's the interplay between the two? Because you, I think what I, I, what I think is happening is that you have to be missing both in order for the system to switch. Mm -hmm. You can lose otters and it can, and it can stay. And the places where, when you lose the otters, the pig, the, the barrens happen, a lot of those were in really North Alaska where are there aren't that many pig yet. And so in Alaska, in Sitka right now, we have a really cool otter gradient. So that close to town, there's actually tribal hunting of otters. And so there aren't that many close to town, but as soon as you get out of town, they start to become abundant. And then there's a there's not that many pignos anywhere. And it's been that way for a long, long time, but only when the, when the sea stars died did all of the reefs close to town start to go down. And the reefs that are farther away from town are still okay because they have otters. Anyway, so we're trying to untangle it and understand the plan is to do this like pick pen experiment first in a place with no otters, just so we don't have to deal with it. And then do it again in a place with otters and see if it changes the outcome. Yeah. That's the plan. I think you need both. We have time for or at least one. one. Yeah. So could we use Southern California as kind of a task? Because are there Cal Force Barons? Because you have sheep heads, yep. spiny lobsters, yep. right? So, you don't have right. So we haven't had uh, kelp horse collapses in central and southern California, which is another reason why I think it's the sea stars because, or I think it's predator redundancy because the sea stars are gone in southern California too, but they still have otters. They still have, and they have sheep head, sheep head and lobster that go up to like Point Conception and stop. And so the reefs down south of like Monterey are doing okay. Which is weird, right? But so I think that that's another line of line of it lines up with the whole hypothesis. Yeah. Funny looking at the interplay with mulchios because one place that I have seen in California, um, at least surviving better than elsewhere, I think it's just now the big population of yeah. mulchios as well. Yeah. Yeah, it is. That's where I can see far more of the shrews that are still there, mm -hmm. the small, um, thick Yeah, I don't, well, I mean, they should be competing with them for food. And there's not a lot of urchins up in Hood Canal yeah. either. And I don't know if that's because of the quiet for the people to pursue still. I don't know. The presence of very large number of wolf eels. I don't know. But I should look at the data and see if we can add wolf eel, a wolf eel angle into the, because we have reef check. Has wolf the other day. It's just that they're really rare. Yeah. So it's hard to find. Yeah. I don't know that there would be, I think that's probably an environmental thing that rather than like they're benefiting each other, if anything, they should compete, right? For that food. But you never know. It's good. That's a good thought. I like it. All right. All right. We'll leave it there. Yeah. <laughs>